what is going on? Hope all is well. So I wanted to do, I want to create a quick video. Maybe it'll be quick, maybe it'll be long. We'll see how this goes. But I don't even really know where I want to start with this. But I guess I will say this. So we know as believers that there are believers who have different theories or maybe ideologies or theologies, whatever the appropriate term may be when it comes to the scripture, when it comes to God, how God is viewed and what God wants from us, how he looks at us. And you would think, and, and as a disclaimer, some of the things I'm going to say is my personal opinion, right? My personal opinion, besides things that I'm going to mention that is backed by scripture. But a lot of us or some of us tend to have a different theology when it comes to the word, when it comes to God. Right. Sometimes dependent on the church that we go to, sometimes depending on the pastor that we follow or listen to or the pastors of our church or other believers that we may surround ourselves with. But one of the biggest, in my personal opinion, misconceptions is that. You have two sides. You have one where some will believe that God is always angry and that he's an angry God and he's a God that every given moment he is looking to take his anger out on man because we consistently displease him. We're obedient, to, disobedient to him, very rebellious. And so because of that, there's that belief. I personally believe, in my personal opinion, that sometimes people's beliefs is based off either their culture, the culture that they grew up in, the household they grew up in. So let's say, for an example, let's say they grew up in a household where their parents, again, this is my opinion, their parents were always angry, always upset. The way that they raised them was not necessarily full of love, but maybe full of just strictly just structure. You have to do this. You have to do that. Um, there was always a lot of discipline. Then that's probably how they may view God. Because sometimes parents govern or parent their kids or how they raise their kids the way they view God is. Those who are believers. I'm speaking in, in, in that state. Then you have the other side where you have believers who believe that God is always happy and he's always very pleased with us and that God is, he always, always forgives us. He's never angry at us. Like he's just happy and, 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 and going. And that's how some believe. And I believe that's also probably the way people were raised as well. My personal opinion or what I believe Really, I want to say opinion, but what I believe is that God is both. God could be angry, but God is also loving. God is full of mercy and grace, but God is a God of structure and obedience and wrath when we disobey. And sorry about that. So I believe when it comes to the message and when we look at the Bible, and when we study the Bible, we see both sides. And so I personally believe both messages should be preached if you're a preacher. Both messages should be taught if you're a pastor and you're a teaching pastor. Both messages should be taught even if you're just a believer. You have to believe both. Because to say God is one way versus the other is incorrect. Incorrect. And I think sometimes we put God in this box that he's just only just one way. And that can be damaging in a lot of ways to those who are following Christ, who are following God. And that's the part that I think we need to be very careful of, in my personal opinion, with our walk. And with any and anything, the, the number one thing that I would encourage, even when it comes to myself, 
anything that I say and anybody that you follow, even if it's your own pastor, is to make sure it's backed by scripture. I think some of the problems that we run into is that we go to church or we watch church online and we just depend strictly on what the pastor is telling us or maybe what other believers are telling us. We don't fact check. We don't go and pick up our Bible and read the Bible. And we live in a time now where the Bible is so accessible. You don't have to carry this big book of 66 books everywhere with you and read. You can actually download most of us, if not all of us, but I will say, you know, the majority of us have smartphones. If you have a smartphone, whether it's an iPhone or an Android, you could actually download the app, the Bible app, or there's other different app versions or Bible versions that's in um, your app store or Google Play or whatever that you use. And you can just read your Bible at, at any time that you want. You know, right here. You know what I'm saying? And I think that makes it so much easier to and make it, to be honest with you, unexcusable when it comes to learning the word. Because I feel like when you do that, you're going to understand who God really is. Because you should be meditating and studying scripture every single day, no matter what you're calling in, 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 in life is. So you understand who God is, what he requires from us, what makes him angry, what makes him happy, what he looks as as rebellion, um, what he looks as what is worship. All these things. And so you're not depending. So if you're listening to a pastor, and really I'm not one of those who really cares to go and call out different believers and Christian and Christians and pastors and so forth. And like, oh, this, that's at this point, unless God tells me to, that's not what I'm doing right now. Or, or do I care to? Because I'm never going to look at somebody as a, or call somebody as a false prophet without me actually knowing for sure that this is a false prophet. Because I think we're so quick to use that term. Oh, he's a false prophet or she's a false prophet. And there are things that our pastors are going to say that we may not fully agree with. Even things that I say, to be honest, that not everybody's going to agree with. But I try my best to make sure anything that I say is backed by the word. Um, I'm very submissive and obedient to the Lord. And I always, always, anytime I have conversations with, with, with my wife, especially... And anytime we're having these type of conversations or anything when it comes to God and everything, I always say, if I'm wrong, God, please correct me. Convict my heart because I never want to misrepresent him or say anything that is not aligned with what his will is. And he will do that. There's been times where I'll say something. I'm not I'm unsure. I was like, God, please correct me if I'm wrong. And God will say something to me. It's like, it's like, no, you're right, son. And he'll, he'll be backed up. My point is that I always make sure that I want to be held accountable in the eyes of the Lord with the things that I'm saying. Because, again, I don't I never want to misrepresent God because it's not about me. It's, it's never about me. Me making these videos. It's not about me. It's never about me. It's really about the Lord that I serve the Lord that I care for, the, the Lord that I worship, you know, Jesus. It's all about Jesus. You know, I, 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 I submit to the Lord very humbly because I'm a servant of him. We all are. And so that's always my approach. That's my approach. But I think sometimes when you go on social media or YouTube or whatever, and even sometimes within our own personal experience that you'll see one or the other. I've seen people, I've heard people really want to knock and disown churches that they feel like they're cookie cutting churches where they're not really feeding the word. They're just feeling this happy go loving message and they don't like it. And then the other way around too with churches where, or pastors where all they want to do is make you feel like you're not worthy of God's love. And again, I feel like if we're going to preach the word, we got to preach it correctly, right? Um, God has many different feelings and emotions, just like we do. That's why we were created in his image. Um, but I want to quote some scriptures, some scriptures that I actually um, wrote down because I, I want what I'm saying is to be backed up. And these are different scriptures. That I, I, and I would love for those who are watching this to meditate on these scriptures, read these scriptures and let it speak to you. 
so you can understand who God is and knowing who he truly, truly is. So the first scripture I will start with is Numbers 14, uh, chapter 14, verse 18. And it says, the Lord is slow to anger. We've heard this many times. The Lord is slow to anger and he is filled with unfailing love. Key word to me in this is unfailing love. His love will never fail us. So if we know somebody who loves us and it's unfailing, it's unconditional, right? And I, I think about my parents where though there's been times I've disappointed them, I've made them angry when I was younger, just being a typical boy, you know, just out there doing things maybe I should have been doing or just something that may have displeased my parents. They're angry, but it did not stop my parents from loving me, from providing for me, for giving me the things that I needed in that time, a roof over my head, uh, food in my belly, clothes on my back, money when I needed it. You know, my parents, shout out to my parents. I love my parents. Tomorrow is Mother's Day. Um, if this video goes out prior to that, then you just you kind of know when this video was recorded. But it just makes me think of that, that that unfeeling love is undeniable and that my parents, I like God, they were slow to anger. But obviously when they were, got fed up, they were fed up, which is going to lead me to the next part of the scripture. Forgiving for every kind of sin and rebellion. Forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion. So anytime that I've disappointed my parents, obviously when I went, they, they would forgive me. They still love me, which is how God clearly views us. But he does not excuse the guilty. He lays the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. And I spoke about the sin is expensive in my previous episode, so I would definitely um, would love for you to check it out. So that's one scripture. This backs up how God is, the balance of God, where he is slow to anger and he's filled with unfailing love. But he does not excuse the guilty. So those who are rebellious, those who are disobedient, there are consequences from this is where the anger of God will take place. First John chapter four, verse 16 states, we know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. God is love and all and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. That's first John chapter four, verse 16. So this is another verse where we talk about how much God loves us. I don't know about you. I don't know Anybody who hates somebody, who loves somebody, but just want to hurt them right away. Love is patient. And that's in 2 Corinthians. Love is patient. God is love. So it says love is patient. That's essentially saying that God is patient because right here it says God is love. So he's patient with us, but does not mean, again, just so we go back to numbers, that the guilty, he does not excuse the guilty. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine says the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. As some people think as some people key words. So that's emphasizing that there's this perception that people have of God that may not be fully accurate. No, he is being patient. Here's that key word again, patient, patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed but wants everyone to repent. So here is a perfect example on why God is patient with us, because his unfailing love, as we go back to numbers, because he knows that if he got himself allowed his anger and frustration, basically imagine God not having any mercy at all for us. Every single time that we would disappoint God, his anger was set in and he would destroy us. Especially if we did not repent in time. So for me, I'll give an example. If I was to go ahead and let's say curse. 
I dropped the F bomb by accident. I'm like, oh shoot. But I forgot to repent right away. It does not mean that within the moment that I cursed, God's wrath is coming right on me. And I know that seems um, simplistic. Is that the right word? Not really sure. But some people think that way. I, 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 I'll never forget. I remember clearly hearing at a church service where there was a pastor. And this is a pastor who um, I think he had his master's or doctors in theology. He's a teacher, no question. But it was something that he said that I felt was a little kind of like that. And he said that if you go to school, if, parents, if your parents send you to school and you failed, you're going to hell. And I was like, okay. And then he used another example. He said, if you're driving and let's say somebody cuts you off, you have road rage. Let's say you curse somebody out. If you do not repent right away that you're going to hell. And I remember hearing that. And I remember I was very disturbed by hearing it. Because I'm like, that's not true. The unfortunate part, there were people in the church who were applauding him. And I just thought that this didn't really, that doesn't make sense. That's not really backed by the word. But I left it alone. Because at that time, as you can hear Alexa in the background, Alexa just wants to intervene. Big Brother's watching. Anyways, so, but to me, uh, and we can see here as I read 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that wouldn't back up that claim. Do we need to repent? Of course. Anytime that if I've accidentally dropped the, <laughs> dropped the curse word, I, I'm quick to say, God, forgive me. Quick to forgive me. I remember once I was playing my Oculus. And my wife secretly started recording me. And I was playing this game called, I think it's called Hot Shot. It's like one of those shooting games. And it, it, if you've ever used like any type of virtual reality game, you can, you really feel like you're in the game. And I'm over here weaving and dodging and all that stuff. And I feel like I was really in it. And so, you know, the Brooklyn came out of me. I'm going to keep it 100. And I, yo, I actually dropped the F word. And there's a video, my, my wife took the video, it was very comical. A lot of people thought it was pretty funny, and it was. But I remember right after I did, I said, God, forgive me. Because that's naturally my reaction, is that. But if I, let's say I didn't do it at that moment, does it mean that by the end of the night that God was going to destroy me? No. Because his love is patient. Um, let's get to Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through 6. It states, so put to death the sinful and earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of, because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. So here is, this is why I said there should be a balance, where this does talk about the anger of God and how it could come. And if we're not careful... And we continue to live a, a life that is very impure, a carnal life. We're living a life that is against God's will. And we're going further and further away the will of God. Then, yes, the wrath of God is going to come and you're going to pay for those consequences. It does not mean that he's not going to have mercy on you. But it does mean if you don't repent, if you're not submissive, you're not obedient, because God is still of a God of order. He's still of a God of structure. He's still, of a, he's still of a God that requires for us to respect and obey his will. And the moment we do that, he takes it as disrespect. Right? God looks at, I believe it's in Jeremiah, where he states, it might be the first chapter of Jeremiah or maybe the second chapter of Jeremiah. I'm not 100% sure, but I remember. But in Jeremiah, he, God is telling Jeremiah and Jeremiah is telling the Israel that their idolatry is basically God looks at it as adultery because you're worshiping these other false gods. And when I, it's it, when you really think about it, it's like, man, you know, you're worshiping something else except the one that who really loves loves you and the one who's really giving you all the things that you need, the one who really makes a determination if you're going to be seated next to him in heaven or you're going to perish in the lake of fire and in hell. So that's just something to think about. So, but again, here it goes where God, it does speak about God's anger and how it could come 
It breaks it down. And the last one I want to read, this is from Romans chapter 5, verse 8 through 11. And it says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. So if God really hated us or God was done with us, why would he send his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? Why would he send him to die for our sins and, and allow Jesus to be beaten, spit on, ridiculed, criticized and everything? Because Jesus is God reincarnated. Why would he endure all of that shame for us because God could easily make the decision like you know what I am done and many times he was quick to do that Moses even at one point um, told God like no like you know remember you're a God of mercy and favor and he spared the lives of Israel. Now, some did pay for it, obviously, and they didn't make it to the promised land. But he did spare. So he is a God of obedience. He is a God of where you are going to reap, you reap what you sow. But he's also a God of love and mercy. And he's also patient. Uh, let me finish off this verse. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Very key scripture right there. For since our friendship with God was restored or for since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemy. Key word. Our friendship friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemy. Wow. We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So through Jesus, everything's been made right. Our friendship with God has been restored. Remember, Jesus is our advocate. So now when we so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. So remember, we live off the new covenant, not the old covenant. The old covenant was the Old Testament, to simplify it. The new covenant, which is the New Testament, is basically after Jesus died on the cross, a new covenant, which was a better covenant than, than better before. And that's what we live off of. So now, right here it states, clearly states, that because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Patience. Most of us have friends. And if you don't, I, I, I pray that you will receive some friends. And we know with those who have friendships, I'm not trying to compare human friendship to godly, to the friendship that we have with God. But I do want to simplify it in a way where if you have a true friendship with somebody and that person has a true friendship with you, you're going to be patient. There's times you're going to bump heads. There's times that person going to be angry with you. Rest in peace to my one of my best friends, Henry Warner. Um, he is that's my brother. I've known him since. Um, really, since middle school, but freshman years when we really became best friends. And at that point, we became inseparable. You know, most everybody knows that most people knows that knows what it was. But there's been times that we bump heads. It wasn't a lot, but it happened. But the moment that we bump heads, I kid you not, within three, four minutes, we're laughing and we're joking. We didn't hold grudges and resentment towards each other. We understood that there are times that we may get each other angry. We argue. And I'm not saying that we argue with God. But what I am saying is that that unfailing love that I had for my friend Henry and he had for me. It was undeniable, even at times when if we bumped heads for whatever reason. And so I think of God in that way, especially when I read the scripture. Because we were once we were once his enemy, but when the moment that Jesus died on the cross, we were made right with God. And now our friendship was restored with God. So I hope this video this ended up being much longer than I expected. I really was going to try to make this a few minute video, but clearly it didn't happen. 
Um, but I definitely want to say, and I pray that and hope that for those who are watching this video, um, that you understand God for who he is. And I, and I strongly, strongly encourage to pick up your Bible, read your Bible, uh, make sure that anything that you hear, read, even if it's by me, make sure it's backed by the word. And I challenge each and every person to really, really understand both sides of God, that he is a God of love, but he's a God of also anger. But his patience is what gives us the mercy that we need. Till then, till the next episode, really, I didn't even think this was going to be an episode, but until the next one, as always, one love. Thank you.